Well, welcome everybody to the Realtors Association of Southern Minnesota. My name is Jason Beal. I'm the broker owner of the J. Beal Real Estate Group down in Mankato and also the current president of the Realtors Association of Southern Minnesota. Our Realtors Association here has over 400 members and we serve the counties that were designated by the National Association of Realtors that cover Blue Earth, Nicollet, LeSueur, Faribault, Martin, Watonwan, Brown County, Jackson County, Cottonwood, and Redwood counties. We provide our tools for realtors to do their day-to-day -day business, but we, yet we also support our communities. And one of the ways we like to support our communities uh, is through events like this, um, kind of generally supporting everybody out there. Um, we have a lot of communities that we represent. We have different committees that do different things, and we have a lot of different uh, uh, things from governance uh, to social committees as well. One of the things that we also do is, is we support a, our realtor pack. And our PAC is a nonpartisan PAC, and we support candidates who promote home ownership and then also protect the private property rights for individuals. So it is our pleasure to host an event in the candidate forum tonight uh, with Greater Mankato Growth. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Patrick Baker. Thank you, Jason. And good evening, everyone. My name is Patrick Baker, and I have the pleasure of serving as the vice president for Greater Mankato Growth. I want to uh, thank you all for attending this evening's forum between the candidates vying to represent District 19A in the Minnesota House of Representatives. This forum is presented by Greater Mankato Growth, KEYC News 12, and the Realtors Association of Southern Minnesota. I'd like to thank the Realtors Association of Southern Minnesota for hosting us here this evening and allowing us to use this space. And if you haven't already, there are cookies, there is coffee. Mm -hmm. Feel free to help yourself. Uh, before I address some housekeeping items for tonight's forum, I want to let you know about our other upcoming candidate forums that Greater Mankato Growth is hosting this month. Uh, October 24th will be a forum for Minnesota House District 19B with Representative Jack Considine and Joe Steck. In addition, Greater Mankato Growth and KTV are hosting in-studio forums for Mankato Mayor, City Council, and the Blue Earth County Board of Commissioners. We also recently hosted a candidate forum for the first congressional district. You can get more information on all these forums as well as links to the video recordings by going to greatermankato.com slash forum. I also want to thank KTV for uh, partnering with us to record all of these events and provide them as a public service. They do a fantastic job. Uh, in addition, Greater Mankato Growth recently published our online candidate profiles. This website allows voters to view information submitted directly by candidates running in our region, including biographical information, as well as their response to a questionnaire. The public can view these candidate or, or these candidate uh, uh, questionnaires at greatermankato.com slash candidates. Now, turning to tonight's forum. First, I'd like to set out a few expectations for our audience to help us present an engaging and civil dialogue this evening. We have more questions than we have time for, so we ask that you help us make the most of our time by holding your applause until the end of the forum and that there be no shouting or heckling, particularly of the moderators. Uh, this evening's format is as follows. Each candidate will be allowed three minutes to make opening and closing remarks. While our moderators will hold candidates to approximately two-minute responses, this evening we're more interested in engaging in robust discussion and getting candidates' thoughts on an issue. So it may take longer in some instances. Any follow-up questions or discussion will be at the discretion of our moderators. And speaking of moderators, I'm joined this evening by my co-moderator, Dion Cheney, with KEYC News 12. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce the candidates for this evening's forum. Jeff Brand is the DFL candidate, and Kim Spears is the Republican candidate. Uh, now I'd like Ms. to invite Mr. Brand to present your opening statement. Good evening. Thank you for attending tonight. My name is Jeff Brand, and I have your pleasure of being the DFL candidate for the Minnesota House of Representatives in District 9. Thank you to uh, Madame Patrick Baker. At uh, KYC, and thanks for the folks, folks at KTV for uh, videotaping this, so that everybody that's not able to make it here tonight can still listen to and, and, and be a part of the democracy that takes place. A uh, little bit of background about myself: I grew up on a dairy in Howard Lake, Minnesota, and so that's an hour west of the Twin Cities. And after I uh, graduated from uh, high school, I went to college at Vermilion Community College, got a two-year degree. It was there I met my wife, and uh, her. Um, her uh, future was to, uh, to go to Minnesota State University Mankato, so I followed her down. And uh, we enjoyed 
four-year degree from Minnesota State University of Mankato. And after we graduated, we fell in love with the area. It's a beautiful place. And uh, we were looking for a place where we could set down roots once we were married. And this was a perfect opportunity for us to kind of uh, spread our wings and uh, grow our roots and enjoy uh, life in southern Minnesota. And so uh, we moved to St. Peter. And a few years after that, I was approached by some folks in uh, St. Peter. They thought that I would be a good city council member. They asked me to, to run. First, I thought they were crazy because I was very non-political. Um, of course, I voted. Of course, I, I participated. But I was never the type of person that was uh, making decisions at the leadership level. And so I, I did what any good you know, person that's running for office would do, ask questions. And so I decided to ask the people in St. Peter, you know, whether it be business owners, administrative folks in the city, um, people in the medical community, people in the nonprofits, I'd ask them what they thought and got their advice. I did a lot of listening, and then I did a little bit of learning, and then I decided to throw my hat in the ring. And here I am seven years later as a city council member in St. Peter, now running for the Minnesota House of Representatives in District 19A. So I have had the pleasure of being a city council member to also be a part of what's called the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. And in the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities, I've had the pleasure of working with 93 other communities across the state of Minnesota on things like local government aid and transportation and public housing, which is in the crisis right now, and child care. And uh, we're working on a lot of different issues that affect Greater Minnesota. And I have the pleasure of working uh, with a lot of different folks across the state, including the Greater Minnesota Partnership as well, Patrick, and through the Greater Minnesota, uh, Greater Mankato Growth has been a part of that too. So um, in that time, I've gotten to know people on both sides of the aisle. I've gotten to know Republicans and Democrats. And I think that that's a great thing to have in, in somebody that wants to represent you at the legislature, because I, I've, I've shown that in three years, I've been able to work with those people across both sides of the aisle. I've been able to hit Clark and Jack and Nick but I've also had conversations with Bill Weber, who is a former mayor of Laverne, and he's also a Republican in the Senate, or um, Ingerbitson, or Rod Hamilton. There's a whole host of people across Greater Minnesota that I've had a great conversation with about issues that matter to all of us. And so I look forward tonight to talking with you about the issues that matter. I've hit a lot of doors. I've had a lot of great conversations. And I'm, I'm excited to, to have this experience and share this with you. So thanks for coming, and I hope you learned something. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brandt. Mr. Spears, your opening statement. Well, I'm Bruce Spears. I have served on the North Mankato City Council. I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to thank you, Greater Mankato Grove uh, and the Realtors Association for holding this event. Uh, I have a very diverse background. When I was younger, I started working in business. I had my own business when I was 15 years old with a, with a partner. Um, and I, I've gone from that. Uh, actually, I started working when I was 12 years old in a couple of club, but then I had a good town business. I worked at many different schools. Huh? We're going to listen your mic when you come here. Okay. Uh, as I was saying, I have a very diverse background. I've done many different things in my career. I've, I've worked in the medical field. I have uh, worked in business. I've owned my own business. I've uh, worked in motorcycles. I had my own motorcycle repair business. I've worked in industry and manufacturing. I've had the experience on the city council. And uh, I think all of these things indicate a very diverse background, which might be valuable in St. Paul. I can see things from a wide perspective. One of the reasons that I want to do this is for our children and for our children's children. I, uh, I see things uh, going, you know, not as well as we could like in our state and in our society. And uh, that's the reason I want to do this, is to help guide, this, guide our society, help guide our situation. and. Uh, and hopefully leave a better world for our children and their children. I think that's really all I want to do at this point. Uh, the first question is, uh, the main task for the legislature when it convenes again will be to write the next state budget. 
Uh, so the question is, what would be your priorities when it comes to uh, spending? Uh, we have been we've been running some modest surpluses lately. Do you feel that we're collecting too much and spending too much, or do you feel that more should be done? Well, since we're running surpluses and that there seems to be needs out there, I believe what we need to do with any surplus, particularly in the transportation area, there's been figures bandied around that we need six hundred million million dollars a year to get caught up in that regard. So I, I think if we had a surplus, I think that would be a good area to put it in there. We need to look at funding on a lot of different angle, or in a lot of different areas, uh, and we need to use everything that's on the table. Um, as far as excessive surpluses going out, I think that what we need to do is uh, we, we need to tailor our taxes to what our needs are. And if we're running surpluses, that's kind of an indicator that we're actually collecting too much taxes. So I think if we continue to do this, ultimately we need to return these taxes to our citizens because it's actually their money. Taxes are the citizens' money and the state collects it and is supposed to be good stewards of this. So I would, I would uh, recommend that. I appreciate the fact that we are running a surplus. Um, you know, I, I think that that's a sign of a good, my mic got bad too. Interesting. My mic isn't working either. Um, can you hear me now? <laughs> um, it's it's a good thing I think that we're running in a in a, in a budget surplus. Um, I think that um, ten years ago our state Minnesota was was in dire straits. We were borrowing against our schools. We were borrowing against our future in Minnesota. We were leveraging what we had, which is our future, and we were trying to pay our bills, keep the lights on in the legislature. You know, in 2006, I believe it was in 2006, um, the legislature, in their infinite wisdom, decided to remove the part of the budget that actually dictates um, the health of our budget based on the inflation value. And so we're kind of, in, a, in, a, in, in one way, flying a little bit blind because we're not actually um, forecasting our budget based on inflation. And so when you add inflation to it, that budget is actually less than what it looks like. Um, and that's something in the legislature they decided to do. I'm not sure that it was a good thing to do. Um, I would probably suggest that we put that back in there um, so that way we can have actually a good health picture of what's going on with our budget. That said, I think that when we have a surplus, obviously it's been, it's been done in the legislature for the last eight years, it's having a rainy day fund. And it's shoring that up so that way in the legislative uh, undoings that if something were to happen, if we have another economic recession, we're actually in an advantage where we have that rainy day fund to dip into. So we're not borrowing $2 billion against our schools again, which I think was a disaster of an idea. And then, you know, I will give credit to the legislature, I'll give credit to the governor for actually turning around a $6 billion deficit and a $2 billion um, budget uh, borrowing from the schools and turning that around into a surplus. I think that took aggressive um, tactics. Those are things that needed to be done. And, uh, you know, as a legislature, we have to continue to evaluate things on the ground as things go. We can't just say, well, this is good, and we're going to continue to do it that way. We have to reevaluate things. Uh, I, I believe that we have to rely on a lot of good data from a lot of good folks that do a lot of good things in the legislature. Just like as a city level, I have to rely on my city staff to give me a good financial picture or a good outlook for what's going on in the parks or um, in the hospital, financials, and things like that as well. And so, you know, it might come down to the point where we are addressing things up or we're addressing things down. Uh, maybe we're taking less in here or there. Um, I do know that we aren't spending where we need to on transportation. In fact, it's been said over and over again that we aren't spending the $600 million that we need to um, in transportation dollars. And so our need continues to, to, um, to build up. These are all things I think about when we talk about a budget. One thing that we're not talking about, obviously, is education. Um, fully funding schools is an important part of that. Um, and so I do believe that some schools are in a situation where they're having to cut programs, they're having to cut staff. In the last legislative session, uh, the Governor Dayton actually suggested that we needed to pay some extra money to the schools in order to prevent that from happening. Unfortunately, um, the legislature didn't get there, and so um, maybe not you know, Nicollet School, maybe not St. Peter's School, maybe not Mankato District 77, but Gibbon, Fairfax, Winthrop, who is also part of this district as well, there are seven high school districts in, in District 19A. They had to cut teachers. They had to cut budget. They had to cut staff. 
Um, in a rural school, that means something. I mean, if you don't have your school, if you don't have a healthy school, where's your community going to be in 10 years? Where are the people going to be in 10 years? Are they going to move to a population or take their schools in a situation where there's open enrollment to a different community? Maybe. And that option's available to them. And so all these things have to be considered. We can't just say, well, we're going to cut here, we're going to add here. Um, we actually have to sit down, 134 House members, uh, 67 senators, and the governor. We have to hash out a budget that's going to make sense and be equitable for everybody. So I look forward to doing that. Thank you. Thank you. We both brought up uh, transportation. Let's talk a little bit more about that. So as you both indicated, Minnesota's transportation infrastructure faces funding challenges at all levels, including a significant shortfall in state highway funding over the next 20 years. State leaders broadly agree that the state needs at least $600 million in new transportation spending annually to fill the gap. However, the legislature and governor have been unable to agree on a long-term strategy to secure these funds. How do you propose addressing our state's transportation challenges? And Jeff, we'll start with you. Well, we just can't print money. So, I mean, we're going to have to find a solution that's equitable, but also a solution that does make sense for our future. If the, if the end result is our roads are in dire straits and they're... Um, I remember 10 years ago, I can't remember who the legislator was, but they were actually threatening in northern Minnesota of going back to dirt roads because the funding was so bad up there for, for regular roads and road maintenance. <laughs> And so, you know, I mean, I hope we don't get there. Honestly, I think that would befall the legislature as, as something that they didn't accomplish and they should accomplish. You know, you can't just invent money and $600 million has to come from somewhere. I think it was the, uh, was suggested a few years ago and, and the Minnesota Corn Growers is, is behind it, a 10% or 10 cent increase in the gas tax. A 10 cent increase in the gas tax is a pretty, pretty moderate ask. What that would do is create 300 of the $600 million that we need in order to create that budget deficit that Patrick just pointed out, that $600 million that we need every year. What about the rest of the money? Where's that going to come from? Well, we could talk about diverting some money from the rainy day fund. I wouldn't advocate for that. We could talk about um, spending less on a certain program. Obviously, there are some folks in the Capitol who will always argue for that. Um, but, you know, I think at the end of the day, it has to come from a bipartisan solution. Both Republicans and Democrats can come to the table and create some good policies. A good example in that 2015 was the electric vehicle tax. So when you buy a hybrid vehicle that drives on electricity because you plug it in, you're not buying gas, are you? So as a result, vehicles not only are getting better fuel economy anyway, but those particular vehicles, those EV vehicles, um, they're, they're running straight on electricity which is good for electric utilities, but not so good for the gas tax or transportation in general. And so in 2015, in a bipartisan legislature, they created the electronic vehicle tax. That's just one solution. There are many other things we can look at, and there's no sense reinventing the wheel. If another state has a good idea, let's talk to other states. Let's talk to other folks that are experts in this idea. Well, let's come to a solution so that we can get our roads and our bridges back up and running again, and we can get, talk about the future for transportation. We could talk about multimodal ta transportation. We could talk about an integrated bus system from city to city all the way up and down the corridor of Highway 169 or 35W or up to Duluth or regionally, regional, <coughs> regional base to regional base. There are a lot of things we can do. We can talk more about bike trails. We can talk more about footpaths. We can talk about uh, what the needs are of the people going forward. You know, it, it takes a certain level of, of, of vision in the legislature to create the future for our road system. And if we're, if we're running at a $600 million deficit every year, what's the future look like? We have to start investing. The $600 million figure is bandied about is like some sort of magical figure that came, you know, I, where it comes from. Uh, you know, there has probably been some studies about it, but uh, it's, it's like a magical figure. It's like a mantra. And whether it's 600 million or 500 million, we need to look at all options for funding this. There is, uh, I have a lot of anecdotal evidence that there's a lot of uh, waste in, in our Department of Transportation and the way they do things and the way they prioritize things. And I think that's one of the first things that we should look at is to make sure that we're as efficient as possible with our department. 
Um, that's one thing. I think that bonding in a situation with transportation, I think that's also an option. It's uh, future use for roads. The, it's the people that are going to be using the roads in the future. The, I think it's appropriate that they would pay for that. Um, the electric vehicle tax, I think that's appropriate in the fact that, uh, you know, they don't pay taxes for our roads. They don't pay for the use of the roads through the gas tax. So I think that's, uh, that is appropriate. So all of these things, uh, and part, part of it comes from a general fund. I think that there might be some funds there as, as well. All of these things can be done to, uh, to help fund our roads and our bridges. Uh, it just needs to be looked at in detail and pro uh, we need to properly prioritize things. I think that's what we need to do going out for transportation and in other areas as well. Let me ask a follow-up. Ooh, that's hot. Um, if a compromise solution was on the table for transportation that included some portion of a gas tax, would you vote for it, yes or no? I would have to know what the compromise was before I'd say. Um, I'm not saying no to a gas tax, and I'm not saying yes to a gas tax. It, it depends on what other factors are in there. My, my basic philosophy is the fact that, uh, you know, putting more money in a situation without looking at efficiencies and waste is, uh, is a potentially papering over the problems. We all operate on a limited budget, and it makes us, it makes us lean, it makes us, you know, it makes us look at what our priorities are, and I think that, that has to be done at the state. It's not actually the state's money, it's our money, and we'd have to be careful with that. I would, uh, I would support a gas tax increase as part of a compromise. I mean, it, compromise isn't a dirty word, and it shouldn't be a dirty word. I mean, obviously, you know, if, if that's the compromise, there's something that's going to be um, on the other end of that, too. You know, at the end of the day, we need to do projects in our district. Um, Highway 14 needs to be funded from Nicolet to New Ulm. That's a $400 million project. You can't just invent that money. I mean, yeah, you could borrow the money. That's what bonding is. It's borrowing the money for the future. And so, you know, we do a lot of bonding in our cities. We do a lot of bonding in our state. And we can do that because we've got the capacity for that. We've got the leverage for that. We've got a lot of infrastructure. We've got a lot of uh, different things that we could borrow against. And in Minnesota, we've got a, you know, a very good standing when it comes to borrowing. Uh, Moody's has given us a good, a good mark on that. But I will tell you that, you know, if we can invent or create or develop something that won't um, allow us to have to borrow from the future, so that maybe we can use that money for something else. I think that that's a better way to do it. And give us the flexibility. I mean, you, you guys as citizens have to give us the flexibility as legislators to do some of that stuff, to do some of those compromises. And um, I look forward to having conversations with folks about how to, how to make those compromises happen because a lot of these things have to be a bipartisan solution. These things can't just be done, you know, one-sided. These lopsided arguments just don't work anymore. I mean, we're all neighbors, right? We all talk to our neighbors, at least we should. And so at the end of the day, not every neighbor agrees with everybody, but we all live in the same neighborhood together. And for the most part, we don't build fences and, and cut people off in, in traffic. At least, you know, we try not to, right? <laughs> but at the end of the day, we have, to, we have to be a part of a community. And um, even at the city level, we have to talk about ways that, you know, with, the, with this uh, car parts amendment to the, to the Constitution, I actually disagreed with it. Putting on my coalition hat, that actually didn't provide any money to small cities across the state, 5,000 or less. And so that's not equitable. And from my standpoint, I did everything I could and lobbied all the legislators to not go in favor of that uh, car parts amendment to the uh, Minnesota Constitution. I just didn't think it was equitable. And so I hope that we will find a solution. I hope it will be equitable to everybody. Obviously, we'll get another pass at that legislature in 2019, I hope. Okay, we have a submitted question here that uh, asks, what will you do to promote renewable energy production in Minnesota? Obviously, uh, energy is a big part of our ag production around here, and uh, how feasible is it, do you think, that we can go toward renewable energy, and how much of our energy do you think can we feasibly get from renewables? That's a question that um, relates to now, but it also relates to down the road in the future. Um, you know, We've got utilities in the state of Minnesota that are actually asking for that renewable energy standard to be increased. 
Again, that's utilities that are asking for that. That's not citizens, although it is perhaps citizen pressure, to, you know, that sort of thing. But for the most part, it's utilities because they're seeing the benefit. They're seeing the bottom line. They're seeing the future. You know, in, in St. Peter, we, um, we bought half of a coal power plant, Sherco 3. XL Energy owns the other half. That's where we get most of our power through the SIMPA, through the Southern Minnesota um, power. And so, you know, th there's also renewables like wind and solar, and um, there's a methane digester in Princeton, I believe, that's part of that as well. Um, but even SIMPA's looking at the future. Even SIMPA's looking at less stranded investments with coal and looking towards the future. And the bottom line is coal is a very carbon polluting um, uh, form of fuel. And it's probably one of the dirtiest, if not the dirtiest out there. I mean, arguably, um, you know, you've got, a, you got a, an industry built around it, but that's it's one of those things where we don't have coal in Minnesota. We don't have oil in Minnesota. We don't have gas in Minnesota. But you know what? On a windy day, we have wind. And on a sunny day, we have sun. And at the end of the day, uh, I really enjoy this. I mean, the worst thing that can happen with a, with a solar spill is it's a sunny day. Or a wind spill, it's a windy day. And you stay inside the house or you put a hat on. And so, you know, when you think about... Um, all these different things that we have going on right now, we've got oil spills that are going on across the globe. We've got, we've got issues with um, coal and climate change. We have to do our part. We have to do our part for our future. In fact, the United Nations actually came out with a climate report that said we've got less than one generation. We've got until 2030 to turn around what we're doing. We have to talk about not just renewable energy. I think we also have to talk about carbon capture. We also have to talk about carbon sequestration. Those are issues that were talked about in the legislature 20 years ago and 30 years ago. And guess what? Nothing got done. Maybe and perhaps those ideas were ideas ahead of its time, but I know that there are a lot of legislatures and there are a lot of cities that are looking at carbon taxes going forward now. There has to be an equitable solution. There has to be something that we can do. And I look forward to that. Just like in the city of St. Peter, you know, um, we were actually able to allow solar to be an option for folks that can actually buy solar um, energy and that actually helps the investment for more solar panels in other communities and so it doesn't have to be driven by the state the state can share a part in that and I believe the renewable energy standard back in 2007 was a bipartisan solution when the governor was Republican and so it can happen it can happen again and I look forward to building on that In regards to the power companies wanting or asking for more renewables, they're, they're publicly or they're regulated utilities, and the fact that their profit structure, the way they make their money, is it's based on a percentage of what they're charged. That's just how the laws were set up, and so they really don't care if energy costs more because they're going to make more on the percentage. So there's a perverse incentive there. As far as renewables go, I'm not against renewables. And anything, I'm, I'm in favor of wind, I'm in favor of solar, I'm in favor of renewable, uh, renewable fuels, as long as they make sense. And in order to make sense, they have to, make, uh, they have to, be, they have, to have their place in the market. Um, if, you, if you subsidize, and, and this goes to subsidies as well, a lot of people say, well, the fossil fuel industry is subsidized. Well, yeah, it probably is. Uh, but I, all of the solar and all of the wind is subsidized as well. My recommendation would be not to subsidize any energy source and let the market decide what, we, what we're going to use. Leave it all on the table. One thing that uh, I'm in favor of is I'm, I'm in favor of probably more nuclear energy. I believe that that's an option. If you talk about carbon, then, then that's probably the most uh, abundant carbon-free source of energy that we have. Uh, so... What we have to look at is the cost of all of this. So far as, uh, as the wind and the solar, up to this point, has not actually reduced our costs. Actually, it's driven up our utility costs in, uh, in Minnesota. And what that does, it, it has an effect on the poorest among us, the people least able to pay for their energy costs. If you're talking about lights and heat and everything for your home, um, you have to pay for that, whether you're rich or poor, and uh, if you have higher energy costs, it's going to impact that population more than it would in impact, you know, the, um, the middle class or the upper class. So it's kind of a, 
a regressive type thing. So I would recommend that, uh, that we keep everything on the table um, and probably not subsidize everything so much. I know that's not going to turn around right away, but uh, we need to look at all sources of energy. All right. Turning to child care. Over the past several years, there's been a growing concern about the lack of availability of child care in greater Minnesota. In fact, recent data from First Children's Finance of Minnesota shows that our area has a gap of about 1,000 child care slots. Many community leaders see this as one of the primary obstacles to developing a strong workforce and creating economic growth. What is the state's role in addressing the shortage of child care in greater Minnesota? And are there policies or programs that the state should adopt that will increase the supply of child care? Mr. Spears. Someone once said that government is like fire. It's a dangerous servant and a fearsome master. What's happening, my perception is that uh, there's evidence out there that our state agency, our, our Department of Human Services, is actually causing the shortage. They're by regulation, by arbitrary regulation and, uh, and uh, arbitrary enforcement, they're making it hard on independent providers. And it's the independent providers that provide all the child care in our rural areas. You have family providers and, and center providers, but it's the independent providers that are, that are the backbone of this. We can't, I don't think it's feasible for us to bring this under, under some sort of a government or subsidized rubric. We need to encourage this market segment. So the policy that I would recommend is, one, make the Department of Human Services accountable for their actions and, and give people that are in this business due, uh, due process for addressing concerns. Currently, the administrative law judges that are supposed to arbitrate between our state agencies and uh, private parties, uh, they, their decisions aren't applicable to the Department of Human Services. So that's wrong. That's simply wrong. So one of the first policies that I would recommend would be to give the administrative law judges uh, decisions authority over these, the agencies. I look at the child care situation as just the tip of the iceberg. This is, uh, this is happening in other state agencies as well. I blame both Republicans and Democrats and, and all legislators for basically abdicating their responsibility to these state agencies, and they've gotten out of control and non-responsive. I've heard situations where uh, an, uh, 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 someone in a state agency told a legislator, we don't have to do what you say because we'll be here when you're gone. And that <laughs> indicates to me that that's a bad situation. It's creating a quasi-government that's not responsible to the, to the citizens anymore. You elect me, you elect Jeff, you can fire us, but you can't get at that administrator in that state agency, and that's just a wrong situation. My wife and I understand child care. We've got a four-year-old and a seven-year-old, and it's very difficult to find child care. We're not alone. We have friends that have kids, and it's very difficult to find child care. And it doesn't matter if you're in St. Peter or Duluth or Mankato or North Mankato. It's hard to find daycare. That's a crisis, plain and simple. You know, in 2013, in the city of St. Peter, myself and another city council member were talking one day with the city administrator about how hard it was to find daycare in St. Peter. And the city administrator perked up his ears. He said, really, tell me more, because he hadn't had that situation because his kids were past that age. And it was because we actually had that conversation in St. Peter in 2013 that we actually had a study where we had all the shareholders, all the stakeholders, the schools invited, um, the, the community-based uh, daycare providers, and so and not only center-based, but also the in-home daycare providers. And we had a great study, and the study showed that there was a lack of, of um, there was a barrier, rather, in, in getting involved in this in the first place because of the certifications that were involved or the modifications that needed to be done in your home in order to have that daycare. And so it was because of that that we actually put some money in the EDA fund specifically for daycare providers. And it was because of that we actually had five new in-home daycare providers. And we got a new center-based daycare in St. Peter. Now, we still have the issue. Infants are difficult, you know, to you know, <laughs> trust me, they're difficult. But they're also difficult to find a daycare for. 
And, I, and that time, and, and going forward, I know people that drive to Nicollet every day that live in St. Peter and work in St. Peter. So they drive to Nicollet, they drive back to St. Peter. And then at the end of the day, after they get off their shift, they drive back to Nicollet, they drive back to St. Peter to go home. It's tough. Parents have to do what we have to do. And we have to do it with the salaries that we're earning. And so that keeps us from, you know, from doing other things too. You know, at, at the end of the day, um, as a Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities board member, you know, I was invited to a, um, a meeting. And uh, Marty Warner from the uh, Center for Rural Policy and Development sat with us and was talking about this crisis in 2017 in Alexandria, in summer 2017, in our fall comp in our summer conference, rather. And she had suggested that the biggest problem is the money. It's the money issue. How can we get affordable daycare to our, to our parents? We don't know a lot of parents. I bet you know parents, too, that stay home with their kids because it's, more, uh, it's less expensive than it was if they were to, to go to work and spend their money on daycare. And I think those daycare providers deserve every nickel and penny that they earn. And they deserve more. Honestly, they do. But at the end of the day, so do parents, too. And so we have to come, come to terms with uh, you know, different things, too, like the wage gap, un underemployment. Those issues exist, too. But this isn't just a state of Minnesota issue. This is a national issue. We know it's a national issue. And I mean, I'm not going to sit here and listen to conspiracy theories about how the DHS is against you know, uh, daycare providers. I don't believe that that's happening. What's the incentive to have less parents working? What's the incentive to have less people in, in the positions that they love? What's the incentive to do that exactly? I don't agree with that. And so I think at the end of the day, we need to actually do more listening. We need to do more learning. And we actually need to lead on this issue. We need to find the solutions. We need to put our money where our mouth is in this case. I feel strongly that we need to spend more money. You know, he, he talked about um, getting rid of subsidies for, for um, energy needs. You know, does that translate into getting rid of subsidies for health care, child care, other subsidies across the state? That's the idea of less government, no subsidies for anybody. And if that's the case, we're going to have an economy that halts. Because the majority of people in this district are 34 years old. They're childbearing age. They need daycare in the worst way. And they don't just need daycare from 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock. They need daycare from 5 o'clock to midnight for second shift. And they need daycare from third shift, too. It's a big issue. I mean, people aren't just pinned down to 9 to 5 jobs anymore. And so as a result of that, there are some great opportunities for people as entrepreneurs to take up this, this whole idea. And I plan to be one of those legislators that's supportive of daycare providers. Because we're going through it now. And I know what it's like right now. And it's not fun right now to have to not go to something because we can't find a, a babysitter. That's just the way it is. And I can't imagine what it's like for people who have to call in and say, I can't come to work today. My daycare provider, she's sick. Or she gave up. She's done. She quit. Even worse. That, that halts our economy. And we've got a good economy in southern Minnesota. But we also need 1,000 daycare slots filled. So we have to find a solution. The pressure goes to the legislator. The pressure goes to the leaders in our communities. We have to find a solution. And it has to be a bipartisan s solution, too, because I know Republicans have kids, too. <laughs> uh, on, a, on a similar vein, uh, uh, Governor Dayton has been pushing very hard over the years to fully fund for pre-K and to try and make it a goal for to be available statewide. Is that something that you believe that uh, the state should be involved in? Start with me? Okay. You know, I'm on the fence on the, on the pre-K. I think the ship has sailed at the legislature. I think a lot of people are sold on the idea. Um, my wife and I, we spend money on ECFE classes for our children. And we notice there's a difference between the children that do it and the kids that don't, or the kids that don't have Head Start. And so that's a difficulty for the teachers in the first grade, and kindergarten, and second grade. We know that that achievement gap changes by the age of, uh, by the time they're in third or fourth grade, but there's still the achievement gap that exists in the first few years when they're formulating what it's like to go to school. And so maybe, um, you know, maybe we have to spend some money or maybe we have to, you know, formulate a committee to look more into this before we actually make the big decision to go with all day pre K 
or a pre-K system that's funded by the state. I will tell you that I'm thankful that the top 1% earners in the state have been taxed to the point where my child can go to all day kindergarten because I see those benefits. I went to half a day of kindergarten when I was in school. I didn't have preschool. Preschool wasn't an option when I was a kid. And so these kids are learning things that I learned in second and third grade in kindergarten. You know, and I think that's just amazing. That sets them up for the future. That sets them up to get a world-class education that they, they don't have to learn just the remedial stuff anymore every, every year. They can learn more and new and different things than we ever learned in school in the 80s and 90s. And so, you know, with this idea of pre-K, there is there's a, a backlash, or not a backlash, but there's a downside to it because obviously daycare providers, their bread and butter is not the infants. They're also the most difficult. It's the, it's the preschoolers because when the preschoolers go to preschool, the daycare providers, uh, you know, I've got a daycare provider that I know of in our community that's having a hard time filling her slots because every kid's back in school now. So she's not making as much money, and it's a very seasonal issue. So we have to be mindful of that stuff at the legislature. We have to be mindful of that stuff as legislators. We have to have our ears open. We have to be ready to learn about these things. Well, Jeff, I'm glad you mentioned the fact that these effects of uh, pre-K fade in third or fourth grade. I think those are the studies. I think that is conclusive. Um, so to demand that the taxpayers pay for child care before kindergarten um, for everyone, I think, is unreasonable. They have our children from kindergarten through 12 years, through 12 years old. That's constitutionally what, what we have to do for our children. If, if we see benefits, if there are f people or children that are falling behind in the cities, I think that there might be something that we could do with scholarships to give those people the advantage. But as far as everyone in pre-K, I, I, I don't see the benefit of it for everybody. It's just going to increase costs. And what it's going to do is, is it's going to do what our schools do. It's, it's a one-size-fits-all solution. You know, our children, especially in that age, are, are not uh, alike. They're all very unique individuals. And they all need unique situations and teaching situations. And I think it's the parents that need to decide what, uh, what they need to do to bring out the full potential of their children and, and not, uh, not a school situation, not an not a, uh, institution <laughs> predominantly. So I'm not in favor of, of uh, pre-K um, funded by the state. Another side effect of this that Jeff also mentioned is the fact that it is killing all of our child providers. It's part of this agenda that's going to get rid of all of these independent child care providers. And what are we going to do? What's the ultimate objective? If you put them all out of business or if they can only have infants, pretty soon they're, they're not going to do it. And then we're going to have to bring our infants into a, into a public situation. And I definitely don't think that's right. I don't think it's feasible. So I think this is a bad idea all the way around and definitely would not be behind it. All right, next question. Let's talk about your priorities. So if you're fortunate enough to get elected to the House uh, and you learn how to write a bill and how to introduce a bill, what's the first bill or two that you will personally introduce? Well, I think I already kind of mentioned the one that I would propose. There actually was a bill passed by both the House and the Senate to give the administrative law judges strength over the, the Department of Human Services in this regard. I think that's the first thing that needs to be done in this situation. The child care situation, for me, is probably the main issue. I know it doesn't apply to everybody, but I think, again, it's emblematic of a lot of things that are out there. So that would be the first bill that I would propose. I would resurrect that and see if we could get that passed and get signed by our governor. Um, and I can't, I, the view that I have of this is it's going to be hard to eat the elephant all at once. So you're just going to have to take it a bite at a time, and I'd like to take that bite first. Uh, another thing to do is, and I'm sure I don't have to introduce this, would be reconciliation of our tax system with the, uh, um, with the federal government. But I, I think that's already in the works. Mr. Brand. How much time do you have? <laughs> you have two minutes. Oh, boy. Is that all? Oh, boy. Uh, that's a lot. And one of, bill. A lot of things to do. Um, well, it, it, there's a lot of priorities. I mean, when I door knock and I hear people talk, 
healthcare is the number one issue. And I thought education would be the number one issue because we hold education so strongly and dearly in this area. You know, there's five uh, higher or institutions of higher education here. There are seven high school districts in our district. I thought for sure education would be it, but it's healthcare it trumps it all day long. People want something that's affordable and available to everyone. And I don't think the privileged few, the people that can afford $1,200 when their mortgage is $800, or the people that are going bankrupt because they have a rare form of cancer and their, their, their insurance plan is not covering it or it's not covering it, period. Uh, I, I think that we've got to get right with that because we live in the greatest and the wealthiest country in the world. And there are a lot of other countries in the world that have a lot less that have health care for all of, their, all of their citizens. And so I think every man, woman, and children has a right to health care. And I would, I would feel strongly that it's not an issue that's a one-sided issue on one side of the aisle. I think both sides of the aisle um, are starting to realize that health care is an important issue, at least if they're listening at the doors, if they're re respecting what people are saying and they're asking, what issues matter to you, like I'm doing, like I'm tracking, it by far and large, number one is health care. And so I look forward to finding a bill, finding a solution. You know, obviously, um, the Minnesota Care Buy-In is a great bill for those people who are paying $40,000 a year that are farming full-time west of here in places like Nicollet and, and Cortland and Lafayette. You know, let's face it, if they're spending $40,000 on the health care, how much are they spending in town? You know, I grew up on a farm, so I realized this. When a lot of my neighbors sold out their dairy cattle in 1996, we lost our grocery store. Small towns support farmers, and farmers support small towns. Plain and simple. That's economy, economics 101 in a rural area. And so at the end of the day, farmers that are paying 40 grand, if they can buy into Minnesota Care and pay less by half or a third, that's money in their pocket. And that's just step one. There's, there's more things we can do. You know, there are ideas that are floating around about Medi Medicare for all. You know, in increasing the Medicare from just seniors to everyone in Minnesota and across the state and across the country. You know, there are a lot of other ideas that are floating around. There's single payer, that's an issue too that people are talking about. I, I just think that we can't say no. We have to leave our options on the table when it comes to health care. But anything we can do is something better than what people are, are having, unfortunately, right now. There's just not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of options, unfortunately. You know, we lost Blue Cross Blue Shield in Minnesota for the individual market a few years ago. In fact, Jeff, some, yep. we, we will get to a question on health care. Oh, perfect. Well, I'll wait for that then. But so it sounds like Minnesota Care is the Minnesota Care by you on, on the first yes. bill. All right. Uh, since we've started on health care, we might as well continue on that. Uh, it, it does seem to be a, a very big topic, uh, especially in the governor's race, too. There are two very different ideas for moving on to the next step from from uh, the current situation with Minsure. Yep. Um, so to talk a little bit about <clears throat> Minsure and um, health care in general, you know, there are two very uh, different ideas in, in the governor's race. And I really appreciate that because now you, have, you, you don't have the choice of two things that are pretty close and similar to each other. You have two very diametrically opposed options. And so you've got um, finding a way, enticing more people to come into our state to sell their insurance plans which I am certain is going to include incentive, incentives to get them to come here. Or deregulation, one of the two. And if you deregulate something, how far do you have to pull it back? And what's it going to do to the consumer? Because we live in a consumer protection state. That's Minnesota. We're one of the few states in the country that are consumer protection. And so I want to make sure that we're not doing anything like that, that are going to roll back any consumer protections. I think this idea of the Minnesota Care Buy-in is a great one. It started in 2015 with Clark Johnson and Kathy Sharon. The governor has endorsed it. The governor has asked to have this addressed in the legislature for the last two years. And guess what? For the last two years, they haven't even had a hearing on the bill. It's ridiculous. You know, anybody that's door knocked with me has heard the same thing. Health care. We've got to do something. And I guarantee you, if you're running for office and you're not picking up on that, then they're not doing the listening that they need to do in order to become a legislator, in my opinion. You know, health care, it can't be about, in my opinion, it can't be about deregulating. It can't be about waiting for the market to do something. Because waiting for the market to do something, look at climate change. Our world is on fire right now as we speak. We can't wait for the market to figure that out. That comes in with intervention. 
that comes with the leaders of this globe coming together and deciding what we need to do. Same things with healthcare. The leaders in our state capital need to figure it out. Frankly, I don't have a lot of hope for, the, for Congress to figure it out. I think it's just, there's too much, um, too many things that are going on right now. There's just, it doesn't work in Congress. But we can do something locally in Minnesota. And I think Minnesota Care Buy-in is the first step. But we can't rest our laurels just on that first step. We can't say, that's it, we're going home. We've got to continue to reevaluate. We've got to continue to put forth new ideas about how we can take care of our elderly and our children and our working class folks that make this economy go. With healthcare, there are three, in our current world, with healthcare, there are three factors. There's universality, there's affordability, and there's quality. You can have any two, but you can't have all three. So what we're talking about here is uh, universal health care, really. Single payer, universal health care. So what are you going to give up? Are you going to give up affordability? Are you going to give up quality? The, uh, the men sure for all, okay? That, that seems like a good idea, right? <coughs> However, it's going to come at a cost. There's going to be higher taxes. More people are going to pay for it. It has to, pay for, it has to be paid for by someone. And uh, if, you know, you say it's going to be a more affordable option for independent providers, but so then it's going to be subsidized by the state. So the affordability and quality, one of those has to go. So for either we're not going to control costs, so the taxpayer is going to pay more, and the people are going to pay more for miniature, or quality is going to go down. And that's what's going to, I think that's what will suffer. You know, the only problem with single payer is that the market has a rationing mechanism built into it. Uh, the government has a rationing, has to, will have to institute a rationing mechanism to, for health care as well because there's just not unlimited dollars. Like you say, the state can't print dollars. Well, the federal government can print dollars. but So what's going to happen is it's just like Medicare and Medicaid. The providers want to limit what they, what they provide or the people that they provide that to because the state and the federal government doesn't pay them for the full amount. For a $50, uh, for a $50 service, Medicare says, okay, well, we're going to pay you $20, you know, and then they put more taxes on that, too. And so by the time you get done, a provider may get $15 for a service. That should be $50. So what's going to happen is people are going to decide not to go into that business. They're going to drop out or they're going to find some other way to provide their services where they don't have to participate in that market. Well, you could force them to. You know, you could say, okay, well, you know, you have to do this. You have to provide it just to maintain your license. Well, then we'll see in, in the medical field the same thing that we're seeing in the child care field. We'll see a shortage, and quality will decline. So my solution, my ideas are we need market-based solutions and market-based ideas. Transparency is one thing. You know, that to know how much something costs is important if you're going to try to control the cost. If you don't know what it costs, it's awfully hard. <coughs> And then you have to provide people an incentive to look at that. And uh, one of the things that I've always recommended is something like an, a health savings account, uh, something where people have a stake in how they're spending their health care dollars. And uh, then providing more flexibility, providing high deductible plans. I think that's, that's a way to go for this. And uh, all of these things have to be on the table. We have to look at it, and I think market-based solutions are important. I think it's the only way you're going to control costs. A few things about that. So as a city council member in St. Peter, we're fortunate to have one of the 12 community hospitals across the state. Luckily enough, in St. Peter, we happen to be the only one of the 12 that's expanding. Um, but every day, we, every month, rather, we get the financials from our, from our um, hospitals. Bob, he's a member of the uh, Lesur Hospital Board, and so he gets Lesurs. And in St. Peter and Lesur, we're, we're finding people with high deductibles are skipping out on paying their bills. Surprise, surprise. And guess who has to pay for that? That comes from the hospitals themselves. And so high deductible plans don't work for our communities. They don't work for our community health care providers. 
At the end of the day, I don't believe that universal health care is some sort of a death paddle. I don't believe that at all. In fact, uh, that's something that Jeff Johnson supported. That's something that, that Kim Spears believes in. And so at the end of the day, at, at the end of the, the day, we have to look at a solution that works. We have to work on something that works. Right now, we've got people that are in tears at the door because they're bankrupt with a rare form of cancer. It's not their fault. How's the health savings account going to bail them out? How is their employer-matched health care savings account going to bail somebody out that has a, a heart transplant? That, my friends, is doom. If you've only got $9,000 in your health care savings account and you need a heart transplant, that doesn't work. But a health care system that actually works because everybody's involved in it and everybody's paying a premium in it, that's what works. We know historically that works. And so Minnesota needs to work on something that's going to benefit everybody. At the end of the day, we need to work on something past what we have now, where we're paying for not just the service, but we're paying for the outcome. So if a person goes in for a surgery, it's that outcome, not so much the extra things that they have to buy, like the MRIs and the CT scans and all that extra stuff that makes the hospitals money. But actually, they're getting paid because that, that person's upright again and healthy again. That's where we need to go, not just in Minnesota, but that's where we need to go in this country. And we can be the leader, and other countries can follow us for a change because that used to be the case. And I look forward to those days. Maybe you say, Kim, we're going to go back to you for the next question. Just want to say one more thing about that. Um, I think there's anecdotal evidence. You know, there's all sorts of evidence out there, one way or another. But the anecdotal evidence is that quality does decline when we have, uh, when we have publicly de provided health care. When you have single payer or something like it, socialized medicine, um, we can argue back and forth about this. But uh, you got to look at the, you got to look at the philosophy, the understanding of human, um, human nature about this. Uh, about markets, it's just it's just natural that we're going to have to sacrifice something. You can only have three of the things in a healthcare system. All right, next question. Everyone seems to hate the current level of divisiveness and partisanship at the legislature, and to many it seems to be just getting worse. How do you view the state's current political climate, and how would you use your role as an elected leader? to shape that climate going forward? A couple of things. One is to uh, make your decisions based on principles and make, be clear about what those principles are. Another thing is to, uh, one of the things that I think is causing the situation is the fact that uh, we're combining a lot of things all together in single bills. And that is causing a lot of the trouble right there. It's providing cover for people, for bad legislation, for good legislation uh, to be passed. You know, we're trying to put poison pills in there. We're trying to manipulate the system all the time. I think one of the things that we need to do is go to, which is constitutionally mandated in our state constitution, is the fact that we need single subject bills with, a clear, with that subject uh, clearly defined in the title. I think it's almost essential that we have to do that. Otherwise, we're never going to get out of this divisiveness and we're never going to get things moving again in our government. So that's the first step. I, I, I think I would have a very hard time voting for something that has a lot of legislation in it. Um, and, then, uh, and then what I want to do as far as when people approach me or when we have discussions is listen carefully for understanding and then try to resolve any, any differences that we have to try to find a solution for that, and then eludicate my ideas and, uh, and where I'm coming from so people really understand the philosophy behind things. Well, I really like the fact that we're passing this one microphone today and nobody's throwing the microphone or snatching it from the other person's hand. <laughs> nobody's hitting each other. <laughs> it's not WWE up here, which I appreciate. Um, at, at the end of the day, you know, as a city council member, sometimes I talk to my city administrator. Todd Prafke, and I say, hey, Todd, how do 
how do you think the meeting went? And he goes, well, no blood was shed. I guess it was okay. <laughs> That's the bottom line. There are city councils that can't actually get together without blood being shed. So it's not just a legislative thing. It's something that's happening in cities, too. There is a divisiveness that's happening. And it is unfortunate. Because you guys, as, as people that are part of the electorate, deserve better. You really do. Everybody across the state that, that's voting on November 6th or beforehand deserves better than all the divisiveness that's going on in the Capitol. I mean, who plays chicken <laughs> with the governor with something so, so easy and simple to pass as a tax conformity bill? with the federal government. I mean, that was a bipartisan bill. It was a bill that the governor was begging to be signed. And guess what? Leadership decided to throw something into it. And guess what? The governor said, if you do that, I'm going to veto it. And he did. And then the legislature said, well, we're going to do this again. So they did it a second time. And the governor, being the good goalkeeper that he is, said, no, it's not going to fly. And so guess what? In 2019, your taxes are going to go up because we didn't do a or they didn't do a uh, legislative um, appropriation for the tax conformity bill with the federal government. Unfortunate. So anybody that's going to go up to the Capitol that's going to be elected or returning to the Capitol next year is going to have to spend time and energy doing the same thing that last year's legislature tried to do. That gives us less time to tackle other issues like education, transportation, a budget, all those issues that need to be addressed. And so this thing happens time and time again. We're always fighting about something. But that's less energy that we actually have to do things that matter to you as the voters, you that live in the state. And so I'm, I'm tired of it too. You know, frankly, as a voter myself, I'm, I'm tired of seeing it. What you do is you elect somebody that's got the idea of bipartisanship. You elect somebody that has a working relationship with people on both sides of the aisle. You work with those people to create a common, um, common good uh, you know, at the legislature. You know, I think at the end of the day, I can work with just about anybody, and I really appreciate that. Anybody that's involved in the legislature, anybody that's a representative, just doesn't represent the party that they represent. They have to represent all 40,000 people in that district. Every man, every woman, and every child. And at the end of the day, you have to listen to those folks. You can't just marginalize them. That's not how government works. That's not how government was founded in our country. And so I look forward to the opportunity of listening to people, just as I have at the doors, and learning from them, because that's something that always has to take place. You always have to learn something new, and then leading. Right now, we've got a lot of people in the legislature that love to lead, but they don't do a lot of listening and learning. And I think that's why they're doing this. I think that's why they're at odds with each other. It can't just be a power struggle all the time. And that goes into this election, too. You know, how much money is being spent in each one of these races because they think they can get a vote here or they can get a, a representative over here for each party? How much money is being spent just for that? I mean, when you think about it, that's pretty ridiculous. And then you go to the next level and you get even more ridiculous when it comes to vote time. I think that compromise isn't a dirty word. We need to work on that more. And so that's what I represent, plain and simple. Uh, on the immigration issue, uh, it's, it's been a, a very contentious issue and different states and even different cities within different states seem to have different philosophies in terms of how much immigration law they enforce or how much they work with the federal government and the current administration. What do you think that uh, Minnesota's immigration policies should be in regard to that? Well, as a city council member in St. Peter, I really like the fact that St. Peter's a really welcoming community. We don't have just one group of people in a community. We have a lot of different groups in our community. And I really I think that, that builds on that idea, that strong base of a community, by having alternative viewpoints and alternative people that, that, that bring new ideas to the community. Bottom line is, we have business owners in our community that are Somali and Hispanic. We also have Norwegians and Swedes, too. But, you know, that's the way it works in St. Peter, just like any other community. And I think at the end of the day, we've got we've to work on a solution that's going to be more welcoming. You know, I, I think that St. Peter is fortunate enough that we aren't a sanctuary city because we're going to have to deal with all the, the back and forth garbage that goes on with being a sanctuary city and being alienated or, or at the legislative level saying, we're not going to give you local government aid if you're a sanctuary city in Minnesota. How childish is that? At the end of the day, we're looking forward to working with our community partners. And so we work with the churches in our community to provide supportive services to people in this country that are here in our community. 
I don't know how they got there. I don't ask for their green card. I don't ask for their driver's license. I'm, I'm a city council member. I'm not a police officer. I don't work for INS. I don't really care. But they're in our community. And guess what? They're our neighbors. They're our friends. They're, our f they're, they're people in our community that we want because they're entrepreneurs. They have businesses. They buy stuff. They pay taxes. We want that, don't we? And if you didn't read the newspaper, we actually have a jobs shortage, or a, a, a employer, employee shortage, rather. We have more jobs than we have employees. As you look at the demographics of Minnesota, they're changing. Employees are going to become a larger portion are going to be employees of color. And so we can either stand in the way of progress, or we can actually work to build on what we have now and build that bigger idea of community. And that's what I'm looking forward for Minnesota to do. Because it's not so much what we're doing now, but it's the next 30 years. You know, it was, um, you know, back in when I moved here to St. Peter, Peter and Mankato, we were talking about Envision 2020. What is 2020 going to look like? Well, we're almost there. <laughs> so I don't know. Did we make it? I don't, I don't really know. But now we have to have the vision for 2050. What is that going to look like? You know, we're standing here in the Realtor Association of Southern Minnesota um, office tonight. What are the home buyers going to look like in, fifth, in 2050? What are the people that are going to be building the homes going to look like in 2050? What are the people that are going to be shopping at Home Depot and Lowe's and Menards going to look like in 2050? We have to be building that future now in 2018 and 2019 and 2020. I think it's wonderful that we welcome our, our immigrant uh, friends and uh, neighbors. However, it's the federal government that sets our laws in regards to immigration. I'm, a, I'm kind of a stickler for the rule of law and the proper role of government. And it's not really the state's decision or purview, and it's not a city's uh, decision or purview as to whether uh, to violate or to allow people that are not legal, not following our laws, not following our processes to remain in our country. There, are, we, are we a body of laws? Are we a government of laws or are we not? And if cities, you know, there's a penalty for all of us if we break laws. You know, we go to jail, we, we pay fines. If a city or a community decides that they're not going to follow our laws, for our federal laws, then there naturally should be follow from that a penalty. So it's not the legal uh, immigrants that uh, I'm concerned about. I welcome them. As long as they're here uh, and they want to be a productive member of our society, I think that's just, that's just great. But if you're going to break our laws, I think that, uh, and, and if we're going to enable that, then there has to be penalties for that. Thank you. So I happen to be a resident of uh, District 19A. And as someone that has a mailbox in District 19A uh, and a TV, I can tell you that there's been uh, a fair amount of money spent in this district on this particular race, uh, some by the candidates, some by outside groups. And so my question is this. What is something that you think the public, the media, or your opponent either gets wrong or doesn't understand about you? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Jeff for being positive in his literature for, you know, his own campaign. I put out the issues I'm positive. All of this negative literature is coming from independent expenditures, and it's not good. It's not pretty. Um, Jeff has had some information come out about him, but I think predominantly it's been focused on the issues, you know, and how, how he may or may not be responsible or involved with some of the things that are mentioned in there. I'll leave that for everyone else to decide. I've been called a racist and a homophobe and I don't think that is really appropriate. I, I, I like to look at everybody as an individual. I don't look at the color of anybody's skin. I don't look at their sexuality. I, I always deal with people as an individual and I think that's the proper way to do it. Now some people call that racist and I just you know, if, if that's your belief, if, if uh, believing that someone looks at people as individuals and deals with them as such, instead of as a total group, is a racist, then, then that's the title. But I don't accept that. So there's just a lot of bad, negative stuff. And uh, 
people that know me know my character. <laughs> they know that I'm a good person, and uh, they know that I try to deal fairly with everybody that I, that I encounter. What a loaded question uh, this is, and it's a, I appreciate the question. You know, um, I've heard from people that the Republican Party is going to spend $500,000 against me in this race. That's money that could be spent on a lot of other good things besides me. <laughs> I guess that it must be that much of a danger to everybody in this, in this room, and everybody in this district, and everybody in this state, that they're going to spend $500,000 against me. And all they have is issues. Jeff Brand's bad on this, and Jeff Brand's bad on that. But you know what? Jeff Brand's not bad at that. Ask anybody that lives in St. Peter. Ask your friends and neighbors that have, been, have had conversations with me at the door. I'm not such a bad guy. In fact, I've got a very good record of being a, a coalition builder. I've got a good record of being a person that's a, been a community builder since we moved here, actually. In 2007, before I, was, uh, before I graduated from MSU, I actually received a community award from MSU because I actually collected toys while I was at MSU for those two years and brought them to a reservation in South Dakota for Christmas. I like to be a leader, and I love to be a leader by example, and I love to bring people with me. And I think the people that are in my campaign, a lot of them are female because I want to give them the experience of what it's like to run because someday I want them to run for something too. And I think that they deserve the chance to be leaders too. And so I'm very open and I'm very excited for that opportunity for those people and I would love to support them someday. Just like Clark's supportive and Nick is supportive. And at the end of the day, a person's record is a person's record. And so, you know, at the end of the day, if you're trying to be a representative, you can't hide behind something that's in your past. And frankly, I mean, Kim, it's fair to say that your record also involves social media. And it's very peculiar that from 2014, when you started your Twitter account in 2018, there's no tweets. But guess what? There are a lot of people that pay attention to what somebody's tweets look like. And then they get paid to copy this stuff. And in fact, I didn't have to pay. When we were running, I looked at his history, and guess what? I some, saw some pretty ugly stuff. Also, some other people saw some pretty ugly stuff. And guess what? Those mailers are coming out against him on that. And I think that's his record. And those are the types of things that people have to be accountable for. And I'm sorry, but if you try to represent everybody in this community, you can't put down public teachers. You can't put down Muslims. You can't put down people in your own community and expect to be about politics is about people. That's garbage. It's not about people at that point. It's about politics. And I think that's unfair. And so at the end of the day, you know, a person's record is a person's record. And, you know, I'll have a record someday if I get elected. And people could say, Jeff voted this way, Jeff voted that way. And we can have those conversations too. And I love to have those conversations. But right now what people know about me in St. Peter is I'm a city council member. I'm level-headed. I work with people. I work with everybody in St. Peter, not just the people in my ward. And we're doing some pretty damn good things in St. Peter. And so that's my record. What are your specific allegations against me, Jeff? You know, you take a few tweets, you know, you don't really look at the whole history, you know, you, you just capture what, what makes your point. And, uh, and there's no context to it, Not, nothing overall. So if you're going to make allegations, you know, be specific and, and allow me to rebut that. I'll let the voters decide. That's what you'll have to decide, you know, I, I mean, Look at who's putting the information out. He says uh, that, the, uh, that the Republicans are going to uh, pay a ton of money for, against him. The DFL is paying a ton of money against me as well. So it's tit for tat, you know. And I, again, refute the, those allegations against me. You're right to do so. Okay, I'll go to another submitted question here. Uh, when it comes to adequate uh, local government aid funding to build infrastructure like water towers and libraries, uh, what's the role of government in that? Uh, there there's, seems to be sometimes there's a dispute over whether that formula is fair or not. My understanding of local government aid is that it's designed to help our 
rural communities, our smaller cities and towns to, to survive. They don't have the tax base that the, that the uh, Twin Cities has. And uh, so they really, they need that. That was the function, that was the intent. Uh, what's happened is now we have many, we have every city uh, collecting local government aid. So, you know, really now I have difficulty understanding what the point is. It's just uh, another funding stream for cities and, and governments. So I think if anything, we need to maintain our local government aid for our small towns and our small cities, and we might want to reduce that for Minneapolis and St. Paul. In St. Peter, our local government aid allocation is about $4 million. Sounds like a lot, right? It's so over 51% of our budget. But guess what? Over 51% of our tax base is non-taxable in the city of St. Peter. We've got the regional treatment center. We've got schools. We've got nonprofits. We have uh, city-owned properties. We have county-owned properties, including the county seat. And so we need local government aid in order to be prosperous. And not just us, it's also Nicollet. It's also Lafayette. Hey, Lafayette's going to need a new water tower in a couple of years. And guess what? Their tax base isn't going to do that for them. And so even the allocation of local government aid that they receive isn't going to be enough. And so that becomes something that in the bonnet year, we're going to have to, as a representative, we're going to have to represent those communities and try to find some money for them, too. But I'll tell you, there's been a lot of attacks on local government aid as long as I've been a board member of the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. And local government aid is actually a piece of the, the discussion that we have at the legislature with both sides of the aisle. And I'll tell you what, uh, being a board member, I actually put up more fires amongst the people with all these different myths about local government that exist up there that run rampant uh, at the Capitol. And I'm sure that some of the sitting legislators can also tell you some stories, too. And they're probably defending local government aid, too, because it affects North Mankato. It affects St. Peter. It affects Mankato, too. And a lot of other communities across the state. Now, I'll tell you, uh, when I'm at the door, people complain about their property taxes being so high. Well, guess what? It's because the local government aid um, that we receive in our communities is less than we received in 2002. And we live in 2018, almost 2019. Go try to buy a police car with money from 2002. Go try to buy a sidewalk in 2002 dollars. It doesn't go very far. You only get three wheels on the police car, not four. The engine sold separately. <laughs> and, and so local government aid, we need, to, we need to invest in our communities again. You know, local government aid is important uh, piece to having a thriving community. And so in 2002, when, in, when, in the Palenti years, when things were scarce and we, were in a, and we were in a recession, we were almost in the depression, the Great Recession occurred, that's when they started peeling back all these local government aids and different things like that. We've never been able to get an increase that matches what we need in the current budget. And so guess what? We have to levy for that. It comes out of your pocket, in your pocket too. It comes out of your taxes. And it's not just the cities, it's also the counties. There are 87 counties in this district, or in the state, that also need money too. And so that's roads. That's, that's money that could be used on Kind Road 12. You know? Um, the, 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 the needs are there. And so either we tax you more, maybe if you're in your fixed income, we tax you out of your own house, or we cut and slash and remove services. And I'll be happy to have those conversations with you guys too because we could talk about what we want to cut. But tell me what you want to cut. Just don't say you want to cut taxes because that's not fair. That's diluting the discussion. Tell me what you want to get rid of. You want to go to single lane roads? You want to go to dirt roads? Tell me what you want to see. Because if that's your vision for the future, let's talk about that too. But local government aid is an integral part of our communities. And it's not going anywhere. When you start picking apart Minneapolis and St. Paul and Rochester and Duluth, you start letting a little bit of air out of, that, out of that balloon and a little bit more out of that balloon. And certainly, sure enough, after a while, that balloon's deflated. And that's what legislators have been trying to do in certain districts in the state of Minnesota for a lot of years. Because they don't think it's fair. They're not getting something in their district. So why are we paying for it? Why is it that people that are paying their taxes up in Bloomington are paying for uh, subsidizing the tax base in St. Peter. Well, it's because we also house the most dangerous people and the most vulnerable people in the state as well. And we're providing good jobs for that in our state, our city, which also helps. Well, that doesn't pay for the streets. That doesn't pay for police cars. Local government aid is really important, and we have to start focusing on that in the legislature as well.
I plan to do that. I plan to be very articulate about why we need that on the floor. Well, there's something to be said for fiscal responsibility as well. We've all suffered under the reductions in local government aid, but when I was on North Mankato, the property tax situation that brought me to this whole situation, you know, brought me to this position right now, is the fact that I was concerned about that basic fact, is people being taxed out of their homes. So I provided input to the council, but I also uh, decided to run for the council. And during my term on the city council, we, we adopted a program of fiscal responsibility, basically. We didn't really cut a lot of services. We were able to budget carefully and plan carefully. And actually, we have not had a levy rate increase for the city of North Mankato since I've been on the council. It's actually been reduced 3%. So I would, I would advocate, instead of you know, trying to redistribute all of this money, what we do is we institute fiscal responsibility in all of these bodies. You know, the people that use the goods should pay for the goods, you know. And, uh, and you know, it's poor planning that causes uh, these difficult situations and stuff like that. And, they, and people may need help getting out of that, you know, and, and there's probably a role for local government aid for that. But I, my recommendation for the city of North Mankato is don't count on this. Don't budget for it. You know, make your plans and make your budgets without it. If you get it, it's a bonus. And so there are ways around this, and I don't think we just need to keep throwing money at the situation. And maybe we'd have a little less divisiveness if people took care of their own stuff. Just one quick thing I would like to say about that, because I think it's important too, is um, in 2002, or 2008 rather, when we were facing the Great Recession, things had to be done. You know, we had to claw back things. But in the last four years, the ruling uh, leadership hasn't done anything but throw us a 1% increase. In St. Peter, that's $4,000. Uh, so in 2019, our levy's gonna go up, but thank goodness we could buy that tire balancer for our fleet. So we can actually do our own tire balancing in St. Peter. That's not enough and it doesn't work. And that's part of the reason why you got involved because of local government aid in the first place. Because the leadership decided not to, to, not to increase it to a level that actually provided relief to folks that live in this area and live across the state. And so, you know, in 2013 and 2014, you know, that could have been done. Obviously, it could have been done in 2015, 16, 17, or 18. But the discussion's never been bringing it back up to the 2002 level. That's the first step. The next step is to get it to 2019. Something's got to be done in the legislature. Otherwise, we're going to have to have discussions about what we cut in our communities. All right, so we <clears throat> do need to get to uh, closing statements, but I want to do one uh, last question. Hope the candidates can keep it brief. But it is an important issue. Uh, and that's on ag. You know, Nicollet County is a predominantly ag county. Um, and our agriculture industry, as you well know, is facing probably one of the toughest years that they've had in some time between tariffs and low commodity prices and snow in October. Um, what would you propose as a legislature uh, to ensure that that industry can remain uh, economically sustainable and and, and and viable and, and I think Jeff we start with you on that one uh, real quickly because like we're in time constraint um, real quickly one of the things we could do primarily is health care make their costs lower so that way they have less overhead that's one thing we could do another thing we could do is we could spend money on research in the University of Minnesota to provide new crops new crop opportunities for farmers <clears throat> Kearns is a new crop that's been developed by the University of Minnesota it's a it's a, a perennial wheatgrass that's going to provide the seed that goes into General Mills products. General Mills is chomping at the bit to get this thing growing so they can use it in their products. And it's a healthy uh, grain, and it also grows the next year, just like alfalfa does. And so they're trying to make it weather resistant so it doesn't winter kill and that sort of thing. Those are just two examples, but we have to do things in the legislature that also focus on our agricultural community. Because, you know, we've got a lot of pork producers, and right now the pork producers can't ship their stuff to China because of the, the imports, or the, uh, the tariffs. It's unfortunate you, you dial in CNN and, or Fox News or whatever it is, and, the, far, and the, the President of the United States is saying the farmers will weather the storm with these tariffs. But also you talk to the uh, Soybean Growers Association, they're saying that one-third of the soybean growers might be out of business by this time next year because of the tariffs. So which is the right narrative? And we as a state need to do stuff to address our farmer health our issues, just the same as the national level they have to too. I grew up on a farm. My family sold out their dairy cattle in 1996 because milk prices were what they were when my uncle got married in the 1970s. And guess what? 
Milk, produ milk production prices are exactly the same now as they were in the 1970s. But you go to the grocery store and try to buy something from the 1970s in that same price. It doesn't work. And so farmers are being pinched. And I think that there are a lot of things we can do for our farmers. But we have to realize that our farmers are in a crisis too. There are a lot of things in crisis. There are a lot of pots that are cooking on the stove at the same time, and a lot of pots are boiling over. It's time for a cook in the kitchen that can actually get things done. It's a tough time for farmers. You know, we have the weather working against them. We have uh, world global, global issues impacting them. Those things we really can't do anything about at the state. We could provide some remediation for the immediate issues to help make sure that they get by, but ultimately they have to deal with these issues themselves. They have to make a decision whether they're going to survive or not. It's a tough way to go. But we don't need to heap it on them. You know, we're, we're talking about 50-foot buffer strips, you know, taking away their productive land and, uh, and not compensating for, for that. Um, fortunately, the... Uh, the legislature has provided some relief from property tax for them. I think that helps. These are all things that, uh, that will help their survival. Uh, but basically, you know, it's farming is like any other business. They have, to, they have to go to the market, you know, and they have to do what's best. And it's kind of a gamble. It's a tough business. I grant you that. Um, but they have crop insurance. They have various other mechanisms that we've already instituted to do this. But they have to handle their own business the best way that they can. And uh, again, emer emergency remediation if, to help keep them from the worst of the situations. No one wants to see anybody uh, in extreme distress. So whatever we can do to prevent that is important. But as far as the day-to-day -day business and keeping them profitable, that's in their, in their ballywick, basically. All right. Turn the mic back over to Jeff, and we'll start with our... Uh, closing statements. Well, we're already there at the end of the night. Uh, we're talking about closing statements. I, you know, again, I, my name is Jeff Brandon, and I'll ask for your vote first on November 6th or before, because we can do early voting in the state of Minnesota. The reason I'm running is pretty simple. And people ask me that all the time. Why are you running? You know, I look at those people and I say, it's not just about the politics of being in the legislature. It's not about the partisan legislation and the partisan things you'll do with the legislature, but it's your hopes and your dreams and your problems, and it's also the children, the future of our state of Minnesota. And so I look forward to serving in the Minnesota legislature just as, I, as, I, as I've served in the St. Peter City Council for the last seven years, representing everybody in our community, working with everybody that I can to make St. Peter better showing up to events and lending a hand and volunteering and doing whatever is needed to make that big C in community possible. And I think as a legislator going up there, there's going to be a learning curve, obviously. But the nice thing about it is I've got a couple of people at the legislature that I can work with on both sides of the aisle. And there's a couple of people I can rely on for some advice as well. And I think that having a governor like Tim Walls that I've already demonstrated that I can work with in city council and him as a congressman, and perhaps me as a legislator, and him as a governor, we can do some great things in our state. And I look forward to that too. I look forward to working with everybody. There are just a lot of things that we need to do in our state. Again, as I said, there are a lot of, there are a lot of pots that are boiling over on the, on the stove. As you can imagine, we've got a health care crisis. We've got a child care crisis. We've got a crisis with our agricultural community. We've got transportation that's underfunded. We've got people that are underemployed across the state. We've got a, a labor shortage, and we've got people that need to fill those positions to create better, uh, better industries. And so they can continue to innovate, and they can continue to do good things for the rest of the region. We've got realtors that want to sell houses. In St. Peter, there's only 10 houses for sale. There should be about 60. How does that happen? Well, it's because we're in a crisis right now. People aren't building. The cost of building is, is high. That's something the state can do. We're in a surplus. We can do things. Whatever we can imagine, we can do. Just as long as we have the coalitions and we have the, the right people, the right partners, that want to roll up their sleeves and do what's best for the communities. And so I look forward to that opportunity in the legislature. I do look forward to 
every time somebody texts me or calls me or shows up to the, wherever I'm at and says, I voted for you. I mean, that's really in incredible. That's, that's, that's the most humbling thing anybody can say. And I look forward to earning your vote between now and the election day, which is 20 days away, tick tock, tick tock. So, you know, you've got a choice in Minnesota. You've got a choice for governor all the way down. And I look forward to being that coalition builder that you deserve, that community builder that you deserve. Thank you. There is a choice. Right now we are in a situation where there's uh, two basic ideas, two schools of thought. One is that government is the solution to our problems and more government is, is a better solution. And then there's the other point of view that says, you know, the real solutions to our problem comes from individuals and, uh, and communities. What we lose sight of is we have like a $20 trillion debt at the national level. And we're all kind of responsible for that as far as we all spend that money. Eventually, that's going to come due. It's going to fall on us. It's going to fall on our children. It's going to fall on our grandchildren. And we never talk about that. We talk about, okay, we, we need government to do more for us. My contention is we need government to do less for us and encourage us to do more for ourselves. Uh, it's just... Uh, that's the way it has to be done. We're not going to turn this thing around right away. You know, we've, it's been... It's been decades and decades that we've, we've come to this school of thought that government is the solution. And it's going to take a long time to turn that around. So uh, the idea is to, is to make sure that we minimize any distress that we have to do this. But it has to be done somewhere along the line. We have to take care of our people, but we have to make sure that uh, we build a country that's, that, that is resilient, that allows people to, uh, to use the full fruits of their abilities. <coughs> and uh, I would like to do that. I would like to make sure that, uh, that we have a stable situation going forward into the future, but that we keep the right things in mind. So I'm running for the State House of Representatives, and I would like to vote. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. Let's thank uh, Mr. Spears and Mr. Brand for stepping forward to, to uh, serve um, and, and to stand for election and to share their thoughts with us tonight. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Make sure you go out and vote uh, November 6th, if not before, and have a fantastic evening.